this message I have this morning is an ominous word. I think it's a very strong word that I need to share with the body of Christ. And, and uh, I'm going to preach this the best way that I possibly can uh, with all the inadequacies that I have as a preacher. But I am grateful for the Holy Ghost. Let me try that again. I'm grateful for the Holy Ghost because he's the one that leads us into all truth and he gives us understanding that we so much desperately need in this hour. We are a generation of people that are smarter but not wiser. Let me try that again. We're smarter but we're not wiser. We have book knowledge and we have intelligence and we have electronics and computers and different things that help us in life. We have surgeries today that are absolutely borderline miraculous. When you look at how people can repair their lives and how that surgeons can do what they do, but yet we're not any more discerning of the times that we live in. Jesus was very blunt about that to those around him who could discern certain things in the natural, but they couldn't discern spiritual things. And so we have this void of understanding in our nation. And I'm sorry to announce and report to you that some of the greatest deficiency of discernment is in the house of God. It's among those who should know better and should understand the Bible, but they don't because they don't spend time in the word of God to get to know the God of the word. And so this, again, will be a strong message to the body of Christ and to America, but let it be a fair warning to you as many of these messages, I believe, are warnings to us. This is what the Lord spoke to my heart. He said, America, you have reached your final stages of existence. The new norm of Babylon is here. You have been fitted for the new wineskins of destruction. Listen to this. You are being fitted for the new wineskins of destruction. Let me allude to you real quick concerning scripture that there are two types of eternal bodies that people will receive. One is a body that is fit for glory and another that is fit for punishment for eternity. And you must understand and recognize and realize that when the Lord speaks of new wineskins being fitted for destruction. He is talking about a system and a lifestyle that will endure what is coming. So you're being fitted for the new wineskins of destruction and they are being filled to overflow and soon you will see what it's like for a nation that is bankrupt of morality and money. Fool's gold, listen to me, fool's gold will be in your hands. Fool's gold. In other words, the money and the riches that you think you possess will be fool's gold in your hands. Your 401ks, your retirements, the money you put in safes and nestled away, if they are not sanctified, if they are not kept in divine governance of God is fool's gold. Listen to me. I'm being stern for a reason because many times these words are spoken and the church gets callous and they become numb to it because of what's going on around us. I'm warning you. Listen to these words. Fool's gold will be in your hands because you trusted a lie. You believed in a system based on usury, fraud, and theft. That is not the system of God. 
Watch this. You should have bought of me the true gold, the wealth that flows from my wisdom. America, you'll be abandoned by those you have trusted, those you have manipulated, for they will see the true frailty of a once great nation. And your enemies will ex be exposed. Excuse me, your weaknesses will be exposed to your enemies. Our enemies know our weaknesses, folks. The shame of it is we don't know our weaknesses. And it will be our downfall. Come feast, come feast will be their cry. Heard around the nations as your enemies. Listen to this. Ascend to their positions above and descend to their positions below, and there will be no escape for a nation who has turned her back on me. Very powerful words, very ominous words that I challenge every listener and subscriber to this ministry to go back and listen to it again and again and allow it to get into your spirit. Do not allow it to be just noise to you, but let it be truth within your heart. We're living in very dangerous times here in this nation. We're living in very dark hours. We're living in a time where the church of Jesus Christ is being silenced in many forms and fashions. And that is a dangerous thing to happen in any nation. The dark ages were a time in history when the church was silent, when the church was restricted and constrained from its ability. There was no illumination of truth, and therefore darkness covered the earth. The Bible says in the last days, gross darkness will cover the earth. And one of the problems with the church is that our minds are so geared towards politics and these type of entrapments that we think it is a seasonal thing rather than a prophetic reality. And when you think of something seasonal, you think of something that passes. And there is your error in believing that as a season passes, as a day turns to night and a night turns into morning, so shall it be for the nation and a new day arises over the horizon through the mechanical operation of human minds. We become fooled by that utopia dream and we buy into it. This is why Americans for the most part, are gullible and deceived and have gone on the train, if you will, that has gone for decades on tracks that lead to nowhere. And so Babylon is rising and the new norm is here. The title that the Lord gave me for this message is The Terminal States of America. The terminal states of America. You must recognize and realize that we are a terminal generation, the final generation destined to see the manifestation of Jesus Christ. To be honest with you, the book of Revelation is not about the Antichrist and all the things that are coming. It is the revelation of who? Jesus Christ. That's what John was told and shown. Though there are many episodes and scenes and parts or the last days that must be written out and must be displayed in final theater of life. But it is about Jesus and his appearing. And I'm so glad about that. But until we get to his appearing and the great hope of being with him, we've got to go through some realities in the terminal states of America. I want you to go to Jeremiah chapter 35, Jeremiah chapter 35, and let me begin to preach to you this message. Again, I pray that you go back and you listen to the word of the Lord and compare it with other voices to whom you trust in the prophetic community, most of all the Bible and the Holy Ghost, and let it confirm to you the hour that we're living in 
Again, it's a dangerous hour for sure. It's a dangerous hour to be playing around with the things of God. It's dangerous to be playing around with church and having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. I'll give you a few minutes. I know, I know you do not know where Jeremiah is, and it's, it's, it's been a while, but Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, powerful witness to the nation of Israel, to Judah, and I believe a powerful witness to America. The word which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, saying, first of all, we stop and we ponder for a minute that the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. I know I say this in quite often references, but the spirit of God is still speaking to prophets. Amen. He's still speaking to watchmen. He's still speaking to those that will listen to him. But the problem with our ability to receive from God is our ability to hear from God because our minds and our lives are so cluttered with things that are going on around us. I believe that the church would be so much further in advancement in things concerning the kingdom if we would just shut off the TV, shut off the talking heads, shut off the favorite polished preachers, come on, get away from the blogs and the YouTube channels and the conspiracies and all these other things that fly around like gnats. How many of y'all love to have a fly buzz around you when you're trying to concentrate? Especially when you're trying to take a nap, it doesn't work out too good. But it seems to be that the church is so confused with what's happening in reality because we do not look to scripture to find our truth. We look to people who we think have the answer. There's only one that has the answer. His name is Jesus. And everything that we need to know about the last days is found in this book that you have called the Bible. Read it sometimes. It will be an exciting adventure for you. So the word came to Jeremiah in those days of the king. I want you to see something that's very powerful here, and I believe it's a prophetic significance because King Jehoiakim, this was the last year of the last king of Jerusalem, of Judah. Let me try that again. This was the last king in his last year that Jeremiah chapter 35 was nestled in here and this historical account was being displayed for us. I find that prophetic. I find that prophetic because I believe that we're on the last leg of so-called democracy. We're in the last stages, the final stages of some type of new normality that we've grown up with, the American dream, the American mindset, the whole system thereof, and we're watching a, a tremendous reset in our lives. If you do not believe that our nation has already changed, I don't know what planet you live on, I don't know where you've been, you must have just fell off a of Pluto or some other place and you've landed here like Mork and Mindy. But I'm here to tell you the reality is this nation has gone to hell in a handbasket. This nation is unrecognizable in many places in many ways. I believe the change has already begun of what the Lord has spoke to us concerning the fall of this year. It's definitely a time of critical mass. And so he was that last king. And so put that in your mindset as we begin to, <clears throat> we begin to preach on this and begin to explore this. The last king, the last hurrah of authority, the last movement of the monarchy and setting up a kingdom in Judah. He said, go into the house of the Rechabites. Go to the house of the Rechabites. Who are those? Those were nomadic people. They were people that were outside of the establishment. They were people that were remnant type of folks. 
in which I will show you more about them. But he says, I want you to go to them, Jeremiah. Why should I go to them, God? Because I want to use them as an illustrated sermon. I want to use them as an example because they are going to be the measuring rod for my righteousness. Now, as you're taking notes, I want you to understand something, that the church of Jesus Christ is the measurement thereof of what the world should be, because we are a direct reflection of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We are the ones that articulate what Jesus says, and we are the living epistles. We are a book that is written and open for all men. And so when men go to find Jesus, they find him through you and I. When they want to understand who God is, they go into a house called the house of God, and they find a preacher who preaches about Jesus. They find a people who sing about God. They find righteousness and holiness and a community and a kingdom of believers and priests who show them the way, the truth, and the life. How many all know as much as we love Jesus and the manifestation thereof, he is not at every service in the physical. Is anybody here with me? In other words, I can't show everybody Jesus by just wishing he would be there, but I can show him by the fruit of the Spirit. I can show him by signs and wonders of miracles. I can show him by confirming the word of the Lord. Do you see that? We don't have Buddhas and all kinds of statues and these things that are replicas. We make no false and vain image of God and say this is him. That's why we don't worship the church. We don't worship the building. We don't worship the pulpit. We don't worship the preacher and the person person behind it. We bless the name of God and we show all men through life that he is alive. And so the world and its righteousness and unrighteousness is weighed in the balance of the truth of the word that is displayed by the church. Jesus said he would use the church to show the manifold wisdom of God. Did he not? He said, I would show the world the manifold wisdom. I would show even the fallen angels my wisdom through the church. That's why the cross is so powerful. The cross is so powerful because Jesus was upon that cross and when his blood was shed, come on, we were given access unto the Father and the veil was ripped. But when he rose from the dead, he gave birth to the church and the church became alive and it became all powerful because the resurrection and the life now dwells in the house. And it went from a temple and a replica and some type of place of ritual to a living stones. I'm preaching more than you're saying, amen. And so we move and we live and we have our being in Christ and we march and we go forward as a body displaying both the crucifixion and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's true Christian life. That is the truth of what the church should be, but the church is a bingo hall. The church is a place where you do Avon. The church is a place where you hook up and find a mate. Come on, somebody. The church is a place where we try to buy Tupperware. Oh, nobody's helping me. But the church is supposed to be that living, breathing example of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Rechabites, these examples here in this particular part of Scripture is symbolic of the church. We're in this kingdom, this nation called America, but we're not thereof. Let me try that again. You're to be in the world, but not of the world. You're not to participate in the system of Babylon, but you can live in Babylon. You can have a Babylonian address, but don't look like a Babylon. A Babylonian, an Egyptian, and a pagan. You're supposed to be different. And so the Rechabites, they were different. And he said, speak unto them. And bring them into the house of the Lord, into the chambers. One of the chambers. And give them wine to drink. Watch this now. God says, I want you to bring them into this chamber here. And I I want you to. Tell them that they can drink and have this wine. 
Then I took Jehazna, the son of Jeremiah, the son of Hasbaniah, and his brethren. I don't know why it couldn't have been Larry and Jim. <laughs> Aren't you glad that some of the reading of the Bible is not required for you to enter into heaven like it was for Miss Gillicuddy and language arts? Sometimes when I read the Bible, I say, Lord, help me <laughs> to read the Bible. But he took them and his brethren and his sons and the whole house of the Rechabites, and I brought them into the house of the Lord, into the chambers of the son of Hanan, the son of Igbila. That's, that's another one right there. Notice what is after his name, a man of God. Possibly some scholars say that he was a prophet. But as you follow this beginning of this chapter 35, we see that he says, I want you to go to the Rechabites. I want you to go to these, and I want you to bring before them this wine. I want the entire tribe there. I want the entire family there, and I'm going to place before them this wine. In other words, I'm going to use them as an example of what I am going to say to the church. So he brought them and the man of God, which was by the chamber of the princes, which was above the chamber of Manasseh, the son of Shalom, the keeper of the door. And I set before the sons of the house of Rechabites pots full of wine and cups. And I said unto them, drink ye wine. But they said, we will drink no wine. For Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father commanded us, saying, you shall drink no wine, neither your sons forever. And so again, the illustration of the Rechabites and the church is, they followed the command of their father to live in holiness. They were commanded to live in righteousness, and I will show you other attributes of the standard of living of their community. But God said, I want you to go get this odd type of people, and I'm going to use them as a measuring rod, an example of what I desire for my people. Again, I take you to the understanding of what the church should be in these last days to be that example to show the world who God is and the righteousness of the word. The problem with the church today is that we have become blended in with the world, that the lines have been blurred, that you can't tell the difference between church and a nightclub. You can't tell the difference between a Holy Ghost pastor and some type of philosophy speaking person, some type of doctor feel good that's on prescription medication. Come on, somebody, to make him feel good and to make her feel good. And we've had ourselves blinded to the reality of what is pure and what is righteous. And when that happens, the measuring line and rod and scales thereof become diluted and polluted to where people cannot measure what is right and what is wrong. And the Rechabites were brought in to make this point. I want you to know something. What's coming upon the church of Jesus Christ is going to be an example of the holiness and the righteousness of God. The persecution that is only beginning for the church and will continue to increase will show forth the goodness and the mercies of our God. And it will be a measurement against, it'll be a scale against the unrighteousness. I know that's flipped upside down. That doesn't fit your theology. That doesn't make sense to you. But the reality is this, that the apostle Paul gained more respect by going forward through his sufferings and going through his persecution and going through his beatings than he would have if he picked up arms and tried to fight and have his own rights. Spoke a lot of truth there. You better be careful 
You better be careful of the spirit that's on the church today that thinks they're going to rise up and destroy and defeat the beast system. You're not going to do it. You will be wearied in your battle. The Bible says so. Watch this. But neither, neither shall you build a house, nor sow seed, nor plant a vineyard, nor have any. So he says, first of all, my daddy said, and the generation said before us that we're not to drink of the wine. We're to keep ourselves pure. And then we were to be a people that didn't build a house and we didn't sow seed. We didn't plant. Now, the translation for us today is the understanding that we are not, again, of this world and we're not to worry about your house. We're not to worry about your stuff that we have to understand and recognize and realize that we're only passing through. Come on, church. But the church has been lulled to sleep and is not ready for this last day battle because we've been too busy with the American dream doing like everybody else, trying to gather together and hoard these things up for ourselves and build unto us an Ephesus of protection, a, a great building of protection, a great giant type of, of protection that we can just weather any storm. And I'm not against you preparing. I'm not against you doing what you're supposed to do in the last days. But I'm here to tell you that our trust is not in man. Our trust is not in anything mechanical. Our trust is not in our preparations. Our trust is in God and God alone and God Almighty. Do you know that laws could be changed in a moment? That martial law can change everything. Do you know that the thief comes to steal, kill, and to destroy? The thief comes, he kill, and to destroy. And we have to put our hope and our trust in heaven. We have to put our riches in heaven where there is no rust, no moth, no thief. Nothing can steal from us the blessedness that awaits us. And so this was the mindset. They were people that were outside of Judah. They were connected, but yet they were not depended upon. And this is what I'm trying to illustrate to you under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, that we're to be connected to what's happening around us, but we're not to be dependent upon it. I mean, we're living in a world that's upside down. We're living in a world that's upside down. If you haven't been shopping lately, you need to go on an adventure. Come on, somebody. You need to go ahead and put your Buzz Lightyear outfit on. Get your little Star Trek phaser. Come on, somebody. You need to go ahead and get out there and see what in the world is going on. And I'm going to tell you something. When you walk out there, it's a whole nother world. I couldn't imagine someone being in a coma for the past six, seven, eight months and woke up and said, oh, where am I? I just, I was in Babylon the other day. That's just down the road. And I'm going to tell you something. People are just freaking out. People have just lost their minds. People are looking at you. If you don't have a mask on, if you don't have this, you don't have, they're just looking on at you like you crazy. Like you just broke federal law. You just broke universal law. You just broke the law of Neptune. Come on, somebody. And I understand precaution and all those different things, and I'm not going to get into that this service because there's so much phony stuff that is out there. But the reality is this. We're living in a nation we don't even know anything about. Well, I don't even recognize my country. I don't even recognize things. Look at that prices of things going up and up, and people send me pictures of things that are not even on the, on the shelves anymore. What is this? This is the transformation of the new norm of Babylon, the terminal states of America. And the reality is this, that I should not put my connection and my concern to it. Like the Rechabites, they served their father and they believed the word which was told to them and they followed God. And now God says, I want you to use them. Jeremiah, go to them. And so they didn't, they didn't build a house. They didn't sow seed. They didn't plant a vineyard. But all your days you shall dwell in tents. Can I remind this congregation of those that are watching me right now, this is just a tent. I said, this is just a tent. The clothes you have on, the skin that you wear is just a tent. 
You're only here temporary. You're only here for a little while. You're only just visiting and passing through. We're going on over to the other side to Jordan. We're going on to the other side of the presence and the promises of God. We're moving into a new mansion. Come on, somebody. We're moving into a place as streets of gold. We're moving into a place where there's righteousness and holiness. We're moving into a place where there's a king that will always sit upon his throne. What a day we're living in. What an opportunity and so they shall dwell in tents. I thank God for what I have. I thank God for where I stay. I thank God for the dwelling places and the things that we possess. But this is not my home. We need to get that in our minds. And so the Rechabites, they were people that felt that way. They understood that. He said that you shall live many days in the land where you be strangers. And so the promise was this, if you want to live in that land, you must obey the promises of God. If you want to live in that land and prosper in the commandments thereof, you must obey those commandments. And again, this is the example we have today concerning us and where we live in our nation. If we want to eat the good of the land and eat the good of the kingdom, we must obey the king and his commandments. I know this is elementary to many, but the reality is the church has gotten so far from that truth. They've gotten so far from that reality that we find ourselves in opposition with God. And God is going to deal with the house. Verse 8. Thus have we obeyed the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father in the land that he's charged us to drink no wine all of our days. We and our wives and our sons, he said, nor our daughters. In other words, we're going to make this generational. See, Christianity is generational. You don't inherit Christianity. Come on now, I'm, about, I'm just giving you my introduction. You do not inherit Christianity. A nation does not have the right to say that they're a Christian without the fruit and the proof thereof and the generations taking the baton thereof and moving forward into kingdom reality. You can say it all day long, you're a Christian, you're a Christian, you're a Christian, and grandma was a Christian and grandpa was a Christian and he was a deacon and they went to church and they sang in the choir. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are lost and so it is not a guarantee for the next generation to receive that reality on their own just by it being handed to them. They must have a reality of it. They must have a living example of it and evidence thereof. And that is why that we are one generation away from losing Christianity in this nation and the world. Just look at the way the youth today are in many places of the world. Not against youth, love youth, but many have fallen into rebellion. Rebellion against authority, rebellion against God. You see what's happening in our country. It is a direct assault against God Almighty. Just look at the movements that are taking place, not only of statues, but also the things of God. And it's only going to get worse in our nation. They're already calling for crosses to come down. They're already calling for churches to be closed and silence to be, uh, preachers to be silenced and the church to be silenced. And so we're facing a dilemma. We're facing an illustration of the last day breath that is being released out of this nation. Watch this. And they, they, they obeyed. They, they've done what they're supposed to do. Verse eight, they followed. They said, we're, we're not even going to have our children do it. Again, you look at our, our nation and you look how the church has forsaken holiness and righteousness. The preaching, it just amazes me. The preaching today, uh, you know, pe people just don't respect the house of God anymore. They don't respect holiness anymore. They don't respect the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a sad thing to see. Again, it's not just youth. I'm not trying to single out an age group. It's just the reality of the hour that we're living in. 
In verse 9, they reiterate everything that they were told. And notice this, they reiterated what they were told. And that's how you know a generation got it, is when you begin to live it and repeat what you were told. When you begin to take away the truths and the gospel planks that brought us to this place, like holiness and righteousness and Bible reading and prayer, intercessory prayer and worship and concentration, a consecration to God and concentrating upon his word and meditating upon his word. When you begin to take those things away from the gospel bridge, then you leave a gap that the next generation falls into the abyss. Notice how they said the same things, nor to build houses to us to dwell in. Neither we have vineyards, nor a house, nor, or nor field, nor seed. But we have uh, dwelt in tents and have obeyed. Everybody say obeyed. And have done according to all that Jonadab, our father, commanded us. So again, we see the transfer of truth that goes from generation to generation and the proving is not recital, the proving and the evidence is by living it. Again, the problem with our country is that we have been in recital practice. We have been reciting things. We have been murmuring and muttering and saying all kinds of stuff like uh, Bible stuff and having that type of godliness but no real true power. And the truth of power comes from holiness. And we don't have that in our country because anything goes. I was born the way I was born. I can do what I want to do. And I'll find me a preacher who agrees with me. Verse 11. But it came to pass when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up, came up into the land, that we said, come, let us go to Jerusalem for the fear of the Chaldeans and for the army of the Syrians. So we dwelt at Jerusalem. It's good to have brains. I said it's good to have brains. And so the Rechabites, they chose to get closer to those to whom they were connected to for protection. And they went to Jerusalem. But how many all know it was a setup? Then the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Go tell the men of Judah... And the inhabitants of Jerusalem, will you not receive the instructions to hearken to my words, saith the Lord. So now we move into the part of the message where Jeremiah, he has the Rechabites. He's using them as an example, an illustrated sermon. He's proved to them that they're walking in holiness and walking in righteousness. And they've obeyed the commandments of their fathers. And they took the baton of truth and they translated it into the reality and into their life. And for generations, they lived according to that precept. Now God uses them as a measuring rod to prove to Judah and to prove to Israel, to prove to Jerusalem how far away they have gone. Now watch this. You'll catch the whole sermon right here. And so it is prophetically with us today that God uses the church to lead the world into righteousness and where it belongs. But if the church be dirty, so is the world. If the church be messed up in America, so is our leadership. If we allow unrighteousness to prevail, if we allow character flaws to prevail, if we turn the other way because of policy and politics and because of money and campaign, if we turn the other way and we let holiness and righteousness fall to the wayside, then the world will grow as it has. And just like these Rechabites, God used them for that example as he's using the church today. The world does not understand holiness and righteousness unless it sees it. 
I can preach all day long about holiness and righteousness, but if my family doesn't see it, they don't understand it. And you, sir, and you, man, become a hypocrite. And that is what we've become to this nation is hypocritical. And therefore, they throw all caution to the wind and they go buck wild. That's what's happening in our country. And I understand it is orchestrated. And I understand it is manipulated. And I understand that there is puppet that are holding the strings of men in the hearts thereof, but there's also a devil loose in our country. And the only way to keep the devil at bay is a strong church. I didn't say strong in money and strong in numbers. I'm talking about strong in our high tower, strong in our God, strong in our Lord, and strong in our King, and strong in our convictions. We've watered down the gospel, therefore we have a watered down Christianity. We have spineless Luguinis in the pulpit today that are afraid of boards, they're afraid of committees, they're afraid of people that have money, they're afraid of all denominations and all these different things and they won't stand up and declare the truth of the word of the Lord. They're afraid of gossipers and backbiters in the house and they won't deal with them by using the rod of correction. Well, I feel good this morning. I've only just started. So uh, you might as well just go ahead and, 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 and get comfortable. Watch this. The words of the Lord, O Jenadab, the son of Rechab, uh, that he commanded his sons not to drink wine or, or, or perform. For unto us this day they drink none, but obey their father's commandment, notwithstanding I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but you hearken not unto me. Now watch this. Again, God uses the prophet. He says, I want you to go get that wine. I want you to get the cups. I want you to lay it before the Rechabites. Now notice Jeremiah is the one that told him to drink and not God. You'll catch that in a minute. It was Jeremiah that spoke that because had God spoke to them to do that, they would have obeyed because they were people of exact obedience. And God is using that for an example. He said, look, you are disobedient to your father's commandment, which is me. I told you to live right and live in holiness. I sent you my prophets and watch this. I did it early. I'm here to tell this nation and those that are listening to me today that God has early warned us. He's early warned the house. He's told the church a long time ago these things would come to pass, not just through scripture, but through prophets. There have been prophets and watchmen and preachers long, long, long before me that have been on the circuit preaching the gospel and warning men of sin and warning men of, of hell and warning men of the prophetic realities. There's been those that have given prophetic visions of what is coming to America early, 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 early God has warned us of a financial economic holocaust that is coming even as, as, as times of David Wilkerson and others God warned us but yet the church sits back and says oh that's just a bunch of hot air that's just a bunch of foolishness and because the church acted that way and did not prepare and did not warn and did not preach and did not teach and did not tell what the word says the world said forget about it that's why we're in our troubles that's why we're in our troubles today, because prior to all that started to happen in America, the churches were just full of prosperity and faith preaching, and, and everything was just lolly, lolly, lolly. Wonderful, man. We we just doing awesome, man. This is just wonderful. Then all of a sudden, something smacks us up on the side of the head, then everybody starts freaking out. Come on, church. But the world doesn't believe it. The world doesn't recognize and realize what's happening around them again because the church has watered down the severity. We got folks that are out there watering down what God is doing and how he's moving in these last days. It's judgment, baby. It's only going to get worse. 
And you can think, if you want to, there's a man with a tin can on his head somewhere with mad controls, controlling everything like a mad scientist, when the reality is that God is allowing these things to take place because they're part of judgment. The last day script has been written. And the world doesn't believe it in totality because the church doesn't believe it. Again, we're just going through some cycle. God says, they followed, they obeyed their commandments, notwithstanding I've spoken to you, rising early and speaking, but you wouldn't hear me. Again, there's been preachers for a long time that have been preaching what I'm preaching. Years and years and decades ago, visions of men and women of God who warned America of an impending doom and destruction. But yet we've done a bad job telling folks. I'm going to tell you why, because we're too afraid of what they'll think about us. Are you here? I'm going to tell you something. This is the best time to be preaching to people. Well, we're in lockdown and we got it. This is the best time to be preaching to folks. This is the best time to give them the hope of Jesus Christ. This is the best time to tell them of what's about to come around the corner and watch it come around the corner. Because you're in the season of fulfillment. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, you're in the season of fulfillment. This is the easiest time to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because by the time you begin to get these prophetic words out of your mouth, they'll come to pass. That's where we're living. By the time you sow that seed, harvest. These are the greatest days to be alive. But he's rebuking this nation here in chapter 35, because they wouldn't hearken. And I have sent unto you all my servants. How many? All of them. You got to understand something. When you begin to hear prophets preaching like they're doing today, you're near the end. You're near the end because God said, I've exhausted everything I have. I've given you all my problems. There's a reason why this plastic banana TBN type of churches are being silenced and they're not full throttle. It's because God is raising up prophets. He's raising up the last day handmaidens. He's la raising up last day uh, worshipers and warriors that are going to preach the gospel and preach thus saith the Lord and giving them a platform. Aren't you glad you one of them? I said, aren't you glad you're one of them? I just can't, I just can't stand myself today. You ever just can't stand yourself? Just, just can't stand myself today, man. I'm just telling you right now, we are in a, we are, we are in a whirlwind of trouble. I feel like when mama used to say, dad's coming home. That's how I feel right now. I, I feel like when mama said, your daddy's coming home, you better... You, you bet. Remember that? You fill in the blanks. You better find a place to hide. You better get out of my face. You better do something because Pop's coming. Will you not receive the instructions to hearken to my words, saith the Lord? Said you wouldn't listen to me. And then in verse 15, I've said to you, my prophets, all of them, rising up early and sending them, saying, return ye every man from his evil way, and amend your doings. What is the message of the last days? Repentance. When Jesus came on the scene, what was the message? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We are to repeat, repeat and to preach and to continue to say, repent. That's how you know it's the last days, repent. We need to tell everybody, repent. Repent. Not tell them this, this and that, and well, I don't know, you know, November, we're going to have an election, and now, you know, I don't know if you just do this candidate here. Well, I don't know if you just put enough hand sanitizer on. Come on, church, help me out now. You know that's just a conversation, Facebook blowing up, just people all talking about, oh, what we need to do, and oh, so-and-so got it, and this is the, just go find out what's trending. And that's what the mindset of the church is. Honey, our mindset should be repent. You repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Don't worry about COVID. You better worry about G-O-D. You better worry about your S-I-N. You better worry about H-E double hockey sticks. That's hell in case you can't spell. 
You need to worry about the things of reality because there's people dying for all kinds of things. And when this financial Holocaust comes to America and I cannot be any stronger. I'm trying to be strong and love and I don't want to freak somebody out, but I'm going to tell you something. The majority of the folk and especially church folk, church folk are not ready for what is coming. You're not ready. It's coming. It's coming. It is coming. And we must warn folks and tell them to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Watch this. He says, uh, and, and amend your, your doings and go not after other gods to, to serve them. And you shall dwell in the land which I have given to you and to your fathers. But you have not inclined your ears nor hearkened unto me. He said you wouldn't listen to me. Again, our nation is full of people who will not listen. But that doesn't make me stop. That makes me continuously preach. That makes you continuously preach. And so he says here finally, verse 17, Therefore thus saith the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring upon Judah and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem all the evil that I have pronounced against them. See, again, judgment delayed in many people's minds is judgment denied. Because certain things haven't happened, people think they've escaped the wrath of God. They think they've escaped punishment and judgment. But your God is a merciful God. I said he's a merciful God and his mercies are renewed every single day. And the reason that the doors are still open in life is so that we can preach the gospel and warn folks of impending destruction. Because I have spoken unto them, but you have not heard. And I have called them unto me, but they have not answered. Again, you won't listen. You won't even answer me. And Jeconiah said unto the house of the Rechabites, thus saith the Lord, the God, and the host of Israel, the God of Israel, because you have obeyed the commandments of Jenadab, your father, and kept all his precepts, and done according to all that he hath commanded you. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab the son of Rechab, watch this, shall not want a man to stand before me forever. So in the ending of the illustrated sermon, God says, I'm using the Rechabites as an example of my holiness and an example of obeying my word and my will. And I'm using them to show a reflection and a mirror image of a nation and a people who refuse to follow my commandments. And because of that, they will receive the destruction that I have pronounced upon them. In the terminal states of America, the reality is this. There is no escape. There is no way out of this. There is no way of fixing this legislatively. There is no way to print more money. There is no way to make more laws. There is no way to have a new election and a new administration. There is no way to fix this and the human ability. The new norm of Babylon is here. The beast system is here. We are living in the last days and the message of the church of Jesus Christ should be that of repent. Repent for his kingdom is here. Repent and find yourselves in the hope of God. It's a tough message to preach today, but it is a necessary message. And then finally, the Rechabites were an example of those who would be before the Lord forever. Why were they before the Lord forever? Why did God give them such a tremendous promise and position? Because they did what they were told to do. I believe that as you and I in these last days endure to the end, there's a crown waiting for us. I believe that there is a place in God someday in heaven where we will forever be with him 
and we'll receive the blessedness of his righteousness and his goodness and his mercy. There'll be no more tears. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more broken hearts and broken bodies. Somebody say amen. amen. And we will forever be healed in his glory, in his presence, in his power. It's coming. The days are coming. But we have a rough road of revelation that is before us. There is no doubt. But like the Rechabites, we must continue to be that measuring rod and that ability to show the world who Jesus is and his righteousness. Let me tell you something. Your family and your church and, and your, your neighbors and people around you may not think they need you, but they're going to need you in the coming days. They're going to need you for that hope, that anchor that Jesus is. They're going to need to have you help them navigate their way through in these last days. It is not a day to shrink back. It is not a day to fall behind. It is a day to be strong in the power of God's might and get ready for the greatest harvest. I believe that the greatest harvest is coming and the greatest days are before us. It is not going to be just for some fancy preacher. It's going to be for everybody that's listening to me right now. We're all going to put our hands on the gospel plow. And we're all going to pull in that great net as we throw it on the right side and see the great catch that God has for us in these last days. If you're watching me right now and you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and I know there's a lot of heavy things that were said, very ominous things, but you can look outside your window and see what's happening. Just look at parts of our country that are on fire. We're at each other's throats. Unrighteousness prevails everywhere you look, from the White House to the church house. But there is stability and life and peace found in Jesus Christ. I pray that you would make him Lord and Savior today. All you got to do is repent of your sins and ask him to forgive you and come into your heart. Those that are backslidden, today is the day to make it right with God. He's got a tremendous plan for you. And we need you in the body of Christ. We need you to help us bring in this final harvest. All you got to do is make it right with him. Father God, thank you for this message today, the terminal states of America. Let us be like the Rechabites. Let us be those that walk in holiness and follow the commandments of our God, our Father. Let us drink no wine and let us not hold on to the earth and the possessions thereof so heavily and so tightly that when hard times come, Father God, we'll be disobedient to you because we're more worried about preserving what we think we have. Father, we need you this day, and I so look forward to the tremendous harvest that's coming. Help us to prepare for what is about to hit this earth. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen. amen. Guys, I love y'all. Have a blessed day.